So what is an atom? You may recall that an atom is the smallest component of an element having the chemical properties of the element. The idea of atoms dates back to the ancient Greeks with Democritus, who proposed that the complex nature of the world could be explained if all things were composed of different kinds of unchangeable atoms. Aristotle, though, believed differently. He believed that everything was made up of four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, and this proved much more popular and enduring. Aristotle's ideas were accepted for over 2,000 years. So then we have John Dalton, who proposed an atomic theory. He said that all matter is made of tiny indivisible particles called atoms. All atoms of an element are alike, atoms of different elements are different, and atoms combine in simple ratios to make compounds. His first piece is false because atoms are not indivisible. You may remember from the pledge each day that indivisible means cannot be divided. And atoms have protons, neutrons, and electrons. So the particles could be divided. The second statement was also false because of isotopes. We'll be talking more about isotopes later, but isotopes have the same mass, but they're the same element. Next, atoms of different elements are different. That was true, as well as atoms combining in simple ratios to make compounds. That was also a true statement. So although Dalton didn't have everything correct, it was a lot from Aristotle's earth, wind, fire, and water. Next, we had J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron using the cathode ray tube. The high voltage was sent through, and the cathode ray went up towards the positive plate, showing that something in the cathode had to have had a negative charge. That negative charge was our electron. In 1909, Millikan determined the magnitude of the electron charge using the oil drop experiment. With the information of the electron charge, he was also able to calculate the mass of the electron to be 9.11 times 10 to the negative first kilograms. Next is Rutherford and the gold foil experiment. Rutherford shot alpha particles at some gold foil. Most of them went straight through, but some of them hit a powerful force within the atoms and bounced straight back. That powerful force must have occupied a very small amount of space because only a small amount of them were deflected, about one in 800,000. He called this force the nucleus which is the dense central portion of the atom that contains nearly all its mass. So the nucleus has all the mass, or nearly all the mass, and it takes up very small amount of space. So here we can see that the alpha particles were being shot at the gold foil. Most of them went straight through, but occasionally they hit the nucleus and got reflected back. Next came the planetary model of the atom from Bohr in 1910. In the planetary model, the electrons are in a particular path and have a fixed energy. The electrons do not lose energy and so they cannot fall into the nucleus. Notice that we went very far in about 10 to 15 years from Dalton's theory. The quantum mechanical model is the current model for atoms, but we'll be talking about that more later. So the parts of the atom, we have the electron, which is in the outer area. It has a charge of negative one. So found outside the nucleus in the electron cloud. And the mass is negligible. The exact mass though is 9.11 times 10 to the negative first kilogram. 
in the center of the atom, the positively charged particle in the atom is the proton. So protons have a positive charge. Their mass is 1.673 times 10 to the negative 24th gram, or 1 AMU, atomic mass unit. The other particle in the center is a neutron. Neutrons are neutral, as in no charge, and the mass is roughly the same as a proton, which is 1.675 times 10 to the negative 24th grams, or 1 AMU. The center of the atom is termed the nucleus, and so our nucleus has protons and neutrons. So what do you think the charge of the nucleus is? We have positive and no charge, so if you said positive, then you are correct. So let's look at this animation. We have a particle source emitter and a negatively charged and positively charged plate. If we shoot the electron out, it should go towards the positive plate because opposites attract. Our proton should go towards the negative plate, and our neutron then should be unaffected and go straight through. If we look at all three of them, notice that the electron is deflected more, much more easily than the proton because the mass of the electron is much less. So which two particles are located in the nucleus? protons and neutrons. So atoms are always neutral particles, which means that the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons, because those are the two charged particles. Again, this is atoms. Atoms are neutral. Later we'll talk about ions, and ions are not neutral. But for now, our protons equal our electrons. So the atomic number is the number of protons. It's going to identify the element because protons never change. And so each element has a different number of protons. It's going to be located on the top, usually. So looking at your periodic table, figure out how many protons sodium has, oxygen and sulfur. Then figure out how many electrons sodium, neon, and magnesium have. For your electrons, remember that all of these are atoms, and so our protons should equal our electrons. Restart when you have your answers. So for sodium, you should have got an 11, oxygen 8, and sulfur 16. Let's look on the periodic table just to make sure that we're all looking at the right stuff. On sodium, number 11, notice that's our atomic number on the top. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8, and sulfur has an atomic number of 16. So sodium has 11 electrons, because our electrons should equal our protons, which was 11. Neon has 10, finding neon over here on the right. And magnesium has 12. Again, magnesium's atomic number was 12. So the mass number, which is the number located on the bottom is the protons plus neutrons. So protons plus neutrons equals mass number. The average atomic mass is what you find on the periodic table 
and it's an average of all the isotopes of the element. We'll see how we get that value on the next lesson. So to get the mass number, we're going to round the average atomic mass to the nearest whole number if the protons and neutrons are not given. If the protons and neutrons are given, or just the neutrons, then we're going to use that to figure out our mass. So look on your periodic table and find magnesium's mass. Magnesium has a mass of 24.30, has an atomic, so we're going to round that to 24. That's our mass number. It has an atomic number of 12. So 24 minus 12 will give us our number of neutrons. Because mass number minus atomic number equals neutrons. Go ahead and pause the video and try the next two on your own. Restart when you have them. So chromium has a mass of 52, an atomic number of 24, giving us 28 neutrons. And finally, carbon has a mass of 12, an atomic number of 6, giving us 6 neutrons. So pause the video and try filling out this chart on your own. Restart when you have the chart complete. So from the periodic table, we can get that lithium's atomic number is 3. Its mass number, rounded, is 7. And if our atomic number is 3, we also have 3 protons. And because these are atoms, the electrons also equal 3. So atomic number and protons should always equal. Atomic number, protons, and electrons should equal on atoms. To get the neutrons, we do mass minus atomic number, giving us 4. So carbon, you should have had 6 protons, 6 neutrons, 6 electrons, a mass number of 12, an atomic number of 6. For chlorine, we had an atomic number of 17, a mass number 35, 17 protons, 18 neutrons, and 17 electrons. For silver, you should have had 47, 61, 47, 108, and 47. For lead, you should have 82, 125, 82, 207, 82. And finally, for calcium, you should have 20 protons, neutrons, and electrons, a mass number of 40, and an atomic number of 20.